Take 60,000 tons of steel, 260,000 cubic meters of concrete, 2,000 dedicated Chinese workers, and some of the best design brains in the business. And this is what you get. The Shanghai World Financial Center. Nearly 500 meters tall, and every meter state of the art. Designed to be strong enough to stand up to killer typhoons and powerful earthquakes, and to withstand the ultimate threat by a world-renowned engineer still haunted by his most famous building's horrifying fate. I don't think I ever got through the experience of 9-11. When this megastructure's finished, the world will marvel at a skyscraper like no other, a dazzling icon of China's rise to power. China, the world's fastest growing economy. Shanghai, China's biggest city, the financial heart of its economic miracle. Along the Huangpu River, grand old buildings evoke the jazz age of the 1920s, when foreign powers had made Shanghai their Asian financial headquarters. And Shanghai's highest building was just nine stories tall. That was then. This is now. Welcome to Pudong, Shanghai's hottest real estate, ground zero of China's economic clout. A forest of skyscrapers proclaiming Shanghai's drive to become Asia's financial capital. Pudong's icon, the Jinmao Tower, a state-of-the-art office building and hotel completed in 1998. 88 stories high, fifth tallest building in the world. But there's a new megastructure rising on Pudong's block. It's not even finished, but already it's putting the Jinmao Tower in the shade. 2,000 workers are toiling day and night to build the Shanghai World Financial Center. And they won't stop until it's 101 stories tall, soaring nearly 500 meters into the sky. The tallest building on the Chinese mainland and the third tallest building in the world. 17,000 people will work inside its 70 office floors, topped by a 14-story luxury hotel and crowned by the world's highest observation deck. Building anything this big is not for the faint of heart. In New York, some of the world's best architects and engineers forgot about sleep and tackled the toughest challenges planet Earth can throw at a skyscraper. And even deadlier human threats. Now, in Shanghai, a team of construction workers is turning the designer's vision into a reality. It's early morning, but construction isn't starting, because it never ends. On this site, work goes 24-7. These workers are just the day shift, and their commute is not for the timid. The only way to get to work is in lifts bolted to the outside of the building. It's a great view, if you don't mind looking down. Heights don't bother this man. Chen Shuifu works even higher than the top floor workers. Fourteen meters higher. He runs the Favel Favco M900D. 
one of the most powerful high-rise construction cranes in the world. Without Chen Shui-Fu and his crane, this 90-story megastructure would still be a hole in the ground. Because building it starts with steel, lots of steel. It takes 650 tons to build just one floor. That's the weight of 90 elephants. Multiply that by 101 floors and you get over 65,000 tons of steel. That's 10 times heavier than the Eiffel Tower. And as the building gets taller, steel has to go higher, a lot higher. Construction's now past the 400 meter mark. Up to the 91st floor, only 10 floors short of the top. To build those final 10 floors, six and a half thousand tons of steel need to get from here to there. And that's where Chen Shui-Fu comes in. He and his fellow crane operators hoist multi-ton beams over 400 meters. Their shifts run day and night, and no one ever knocks off early. The World Financial Center is the biggest project I have worked on. Usually we start work at 6 a.m., we bring some bread and noodles for lunch. We finish work at 6 p.m., so we work a total of 12 hours a day. Now that the financial center's over 90 stories high, Chen Shui-Fu does his job hundreds of meters in the air. But when construction started, he worked just above street level. His crane anchored to the basement. How does a 250-ton crane stay higher than the skyscraper it's building? That's one of the most amazing things about the M900D. This mega crane doesn't just lift enormous beams of steel. It can also lift itself. As the building rises, it rises too. By jacking up its tower with powerful hydraulic rams and inserting new tower sections. To do that, those jacks have to push a 250-ton crane 40 meters straight up. But to work at these heights, a crane needs to be more than just strong. It has to be fast and smart. The M900D definitely fits the bill. These cranes don't flinch at lifting 32-ton loads 400 meters up at 36 meters per minute. In fact, 400 meters is child's play. The M900D's hook hangs from a wire rope that's 750 meters long, the length of 10 jumbo jets. And this crane has a brain. Its drive system knows when there's nothing on the hook and gives the okay for the hook to go full speed to the ground. When the hook's got a full load, it's a different story. The motor switches to full power and pulls huge hunks of steel hundreds of meters above the ground. Every time he lands a beam safely on top, Chen Shui-Fu can relax for a moment. But the new arrival gives others plenty to worry about. A team of expert steel workers must now wrestle the giant beams into place and bolt them together. One of those steel workers is Zhang Shou Yang. He spent years working at one of China's biggest shipyards, with both feet firmly planted on the ground. When he came to work at the World Financial Center, he found out fast that 400 meters up in the air working with steel, calls for nerves of steel. At the beginning, I was nervous, and my hands and feet were shaking. After a while, I managed to overcome it.
To someone starting this job, I would say safety first on the first day. Be careful when climbing up and down the ladders and scaffolds. Safety is first and foremost for you at this height, because only when you are safe can your family be happy. If you have an accident, your whole family will bear the consequences. As the workers pass 400 meters, they're heading into unknown territory. In mainland China, no one has ever built as high as they are going, and the Chinese building code stops at 350 meters. They're literally moving off the charts, and there's still nearly 100 meters to go. As they close in on success. It's hard to imagine how many challenges blocked their path, and that this magnificent structure once seemed doomed to fail. Nineteen ninety, China's central government announces plans to transform an aging Shanghai suburb called Pudong into a gleaming financial center. And Japanese real estate tycoon Minoru Mori gets an idea. Mori envisions a mega building that will dominate the new Pudong skyline and rank among the tallest buildings in the world. To pay for his vision, Mori raises a whopping six hundred and twenty-five million dollars. To design it, he turns to some long-trusted associates, the world-renowned New York architects of Cone, Peterson, Fox. Lead designer William Peterson had a challenge on his hands. This was going to be a, a super tall building, which had to deal with the very interesting issues of the connection of earth and sky, which a, a tall building has to do. It needed to be the, a building of great nobility. Peterson discovered that in ancient Chinese culture, earth was square and sky was round. His design blended both shapes into a soaring 95-story prism of steel and glass, lifting the eye and the soul from the earth to the heavens. It was lovely, but no one could build it until its designers solved one big, big problem. Pudong may be million-dollar real estate, but it's also a very bad place to build a very tall building. River water saturated soil, turning it into unstable mud. When building crews pump the water out, the land sinks. Since 1920, parts of Shanghai have sunk almost two meters. At Cone Peterson Fox, senior designer David Mallet knew construction couldn't proceed until the design team successfully grappled with Pudong's less than ideal geology. Shanghai is all alluvial soil,、uh, so there's not quite the bedrock that you would find in Manhattan. Manhattan, you go down one floor and then you're you're sitting on granite. The team solution: if they couldn't build on granite, they'd use a simple but effective device to anchor their skyscraper in mud. Friction piles, 2,000 steel rods driven 80 meters into Pudong's swamp. The deeper the piles push into the mud, the harder the mud pushes back, gripping the rods tightly, creating a stable foundation, floating the world financial center like a ship on Pudong's waterlogged soil. 1997, construction of the Shanghai World Financial Center begins, but no sooner is the foundation finished than disaster strikes. 1997, Asia's overheated economies collapse. The meltdown paralyzes the Japanese banking system, and suddenly floods the Asian real estate market with unoccupied office space. The last thing China needs is a $625 million empty office building. Some of the financial center's investors pull out. Construction grinds to a halt. Five years pass. What was to be the pride of Pudong 
appears destined to remain a gigantic hole in the ground. But by 2003, Asian economies are roaring back. Minoru Mori finds new investors for his mega building. In New York, the financial center's architects get another call. The good news, their masterpiece is back on track. The bad news, its design no longer works. When construction started in 1997, the world's tallest building was Malaysia's Petronas Towers, 88 stories high. The 95-story World Financial Center was on track to take the title. But by 2004, a new skyscraper, Taiwan's Taipei 101, soared 101 stories, or 508 meters, above the Earth. Minoru Mori told his architects, Shanghai's tallest skyscraper must rival Taipei 101. No problem, except the World Financial Center's foundation was already built to support only 95 stories. Adding six more stories meant extra weight pressing down on a foundation that couldn't support it. That wasn't all. China was now the host of the 2008 Olympics. Minoru Mori didn't just want a taller building. He wanted it finished before the world turned its eyes on China in 2008. In New York, senior designer David Mallet went back to the drawing board and stayed there well past closing time. You have to be 100% dedicated to the task. For sure. Across town, legendary structural engineer Leslie Robertson and his team rolled up their sleeves and went to work. Our challenge was to come up with a building that was larger, taller, so it needed to be stronger and it needed to be lighter. I had to stand on those existing foundations. Robertson's larger, taller, lighter solution was an engineering triumph. Its secret, modular design and the outrigger truss, steel beams radiating out from a concrete core. Attached to a diagonal braced frame, a modular design requiring less steel to build and repeating itself every 12 stories. What looked like a single 101-story building would actually be a series of 12-story buildings stacked on top of one another easier and faster to build, giving the builders a shot at finishing before the 2008 Olympics. So this way we got uh, faster construction and more economical construction while maintaining structural integrity, robustness and all those good things. June 2007, four years after construction restarted. Thanks to its modular outrigger truss design, workers are building the World Financial Center at a rate of one floor every three days. At the top, the steel crew bolts in floor plates, completing the skeleton of the 91st floor. Meanwhile, the cranes are lifting a much lighter, but critically important, load to the 90th floor where another team begins the back-breaking task of installing 10-meter lengths of rebar over the steel floor plates. Rebar stands for reinforcing bar, and it's used in buildings all over the world to reinforce concrete. It takes over 150 kilometers of rebar just to cover one of the financial center's floors. That's over 15,000 kilometers for the whole building. If you laid that much rebar end to end, it would reach to the International Space Station and back 19 times. Next step, pour the concrete. 90 floors below, 
What looks like a giant praying mantis seems ready to attack the World Financial Center. In fact, it's a concrete pumping machine. When the rebar's ready, workers 400 meters high will need massive amounts of concrete pumped up to them. To pull that off, you need some of the most powerful concrete pumps in the world. And believe it or not, this monster isn't one of them. It can only pump concrete as high as its arm can reach, close to 40 meters. The real action starts after dark. When concrete trucks line up to feed three small machines. They don't look like much, but these pumps are the real deal. So powerful, they can shoot concrete nearly 500 meters into the air. Through this pipe that runs across the bottom of the building and then straight up to the 90th floor. When these pumps fire concrete skyward, it sounds like one unhappy dinosaur. When it pours out on top, the concrete crew breathes a big sigh of relief. And so does deputy manager Bernie Wren. Pumping concrete from the ground to the top of the building takes a long time. And if we don't mix it right, the concrete will set inside the pipe and will waste a lot of time searching for the blockage. You could fill an Olympic-sized swimming pool with the amount of concrete that covers just one financial center floor. For this crew, midnight is only lunchtime. They started at dusk, and they won't be done till dawn. All this steel, rebar, and concrete looks mighty impressive. But will the redesigned World Financial Center really be strong enough? Geologically speaking, it's in a pretty rough neighborhood. China is one of the world's most dangerous earthquake zones. Shanghai isn't the riskiest seismic area, but a strong earthquake could shake Pudong's waterlogged soil until it liquefied, and even well-anchored buildings could collapse. As dozens did during Japan's devastating Kobe earthquake, which struck just over 1,300 kilometers northeast of Shanghai. The financial center's new design had to satisfy this man. Professor Shi Lin Liu of Shanghai's Tongji University. He and his team of engineers run China's largest seismic shape table. Subjecting scale models of skyscrapers to massive simulated earthquakes to see if they'll survive. All of these structural systems are new. They had never before been used in the construction of a building reaching 492 meters. Not only that, the size and structure of this building all exceed the limits of the current Chinese design code. So detailed and specialized analysis needs to be carried out. For three days in 2004, Professor Xi and his team hit a model of the Shanghai World Financial Center with a simulated magnitude 7 tremor, almost as strong as the Kobe earthquake. If it failed, construction might have to halt, while the Olympic countdown clock kept on ticking. Through detailed analysis and experiments, we have concluded that this building can sustain a 7-degree earthquake. Architects and engineers met the challenge of putting one of the world's tallest buildings on a foundation that wasn't built to hold it. But there were still plenty of challenges to come. After the steel, rebar and concrete, you'd think the toughest parts of building this megastructure would be over. But one of the hardest jobs of all can't even start until they're done. 
installing 10,000 windows. Deputy Manager Bernie Wren wants to know how the window work is going. He checks in with Richard Fan, who heads the installation team. Designing the windows for this building was relatively simple, but installing them is difficult. There isn't enough room to store so many windows on every floor, so we have to get them in place as quickly as possible. On average, the group can install about 15 windows per day. We complete one floor every three to four and a half days. World Financial Center windows are taller than a basketball hoop and weigh as much as three grand pianos. At these heights, wrestling with weights like that can be dangerous. A crane hoists every window unit from the ground, and work teams position and bolt them into place. Not just anyone can do this job. A highly trained team of 130 workers specializes in installing these massive windows. Job hopefuls with altitude issues need not apply. Step one, attach the frames to a winch, then slide them out over the side. Step two, turn the window unit 180 degrees. Not an easy task if the wind is blowing. Step three, Workers suspended on the side of the building help ease the window down to the floor below and bolt it to brackets already in place. Step four. Repeat steps one through three, 9,999 times. Meanwhile, Workers at the top are building towards 500 meters, entering a realm where only a few of the world's very tallest buildings have dared to soar. Up here, it's not just heights they have to contend with. They're in a world with a climate all its own. And they're more often in the clouds than above them. There are days when nature closes in and visibility drops to nearly zero, making work at the top floors too dangerous. When the wind gets too strong, work grinds to a halt. Even the mighty M900D tower cranes can't work in this weather. And even daredevil steel workers like Zhang Shaoyang make a hasty retreat back to terra firma. When you are lifting and handling steel in a high rise, weather matters a lot. If the weather is foggy or windy, it will really affect the installation work. As you can see today, it is very misty, so we are stopping work for the day. When the weather permits, workers will go back up top and continue building the World Financial Center's crowning touch, which will also keep it safe against the deadliest threat to any building that dares to soar so high. At these altitudes, the number one enemy is wind. Typhoons slam into Shanghai almost every summer. In 2005 alone, winds from Typhoon Matsa peaked at over 150 kilometers per hour, causing $12 million of damage 
and killing three people. And clusters of skyscrapers can generate their own powerful winds. The taller the building, the greater the danger of wind pushing it over. A sudden event engineers call the overturning moment. In the design of any tall building, one is essentially creating a, a beam that's vertically projected from the earth. But the greater force for tall buildings is the actual overturning moment that is generated by the wind, which it tends to want to push the building over. So how do you keep a 500-meter megastructure standing in a typhoon? You don't fight the wind, you let it through. The financial center's architects crowned its topmost floors with a gigantic circle, 53 meters in diameter. A wind hole that would let winds through, preventing them from pushing over the building. In Chinese mythology, a circle was a symbol of the sun, the moon, and the heavens. The New York architects were proud of the elegant circle inspired by tradition, and were stunned when Chinese authorities objected to it. It wasn't until we read, I believe, in a Hong Kong paper when it said a Japanese developer is coming into Shanghai with the flag raised high. And then finally we got it. What the architects never thought of was that in China, a giant circle atop a Japanese finance building would be a symbol of something very different. Japan's 1937 attack on China, when her armies marched under the imperial banner of the rising sun. For the design team, it was not a good day. We went to lunch, and um, we were served um, a, a live lobster. Well, for some reason or other, I felt as if that this was enormously symbolic, because I felt, <laughs> indeed, like I was the lobster. In New York, it was back to the drawing board, and many sleepless nights for senior designer David Mallet. I would be lying if I said it wasn't heart-wrenching when, when something you've been working on for years is suddenly changed overnight. The team bisected the circular wind hole with an enclosed walkway, offering visitors a chance to see the world from almost 500 meters up. Engineers tested the new design in a wind tunnel. The wind hole passed with flying colors. But its modified design didn't satisfy the critics. The circle would have to go. We changed it to a, a form which uh, is more, I think, um, in line with the, the shape of the building's geometry at the top. Uh, and frankly, uh, I, I'm very pleased uh, with it because I believe it, re it relates more strongly to this particular uh, uh, building shape. And that's what's about to take shape on the 94th floor, a politically neutral wind hole shaped like a trapezoid that still offers visitors amazing views. The highest observation deck of any building in the world. To get a view higher than this, you'd have to climb a mountain or get into an aeroplane. But just like a mountaintop or an aeroplane ride, if the wind is strong enough, it can knock you around. In a building this tall, anyone on the topmost floors will definitely know when strong winds blow or when an earthquake strikes. Winds and earthquakes create an effect called whiplash, which can sway a super tall building from side to side. This happens at the top of the building because the structure at the top is less stiff. The vibration is more intense. 
When it happens, it is very obvious. If you are at the top of the building when an earthquake strikes, the vibration at the top is very strong. But there is no threat to the safety of the building. However, the people at the top will feel very uncomfortable. But people atop the World Financial Center will hardly notice any whiplash. Thanks to two active tuned mass dampers installed on the 90th floor. These dampers counteract whiplash by pushing 150 ton counterweights in the opposite direction, reducing sway during high winds and earthquakes to just one meter. But it's not easy getting weights that heavy up to the 90th floor. Even the mighty M900D cranes have to bring them up in pieces, one at a time, with the skillful crane drivers slotting them into the damper frames. It's a long, laborious task that goes all day and well into the night. The dampers will allow visitors to the top to enjoy the view in all kinds of weather. And what these workers are installing will get them there. One of the most advanced elevator systems in the world. An amazing 91 elevators in all, many of them double-decked, that can whisk the 17,000 office workers and hotel guests anywhere in this mega building in only minutes. One can even lift luxury cars to auto shows on top of the world. He took one of the double deck elevators and actually uh, removed the intermediate floor. So you could take a car, turn it vertically uh, within the elevator and then go up to and, and have your exhibition. Four special lifts will run from the bottom to the top along the building's outside edges, giving visitors the ride and the view of their lives. But these outside lifts will also have a much more serious purpose. Because in the 21st century, designing mega buildings to meet nature's challenges is no longer enough. Like all tall buildings, the Shanghai World Financial Center must now confront a new and horrifying threat. September 11, 2001. In Shanghai, the World Financial Center is a foundation waiting for a building. Across the world in New York, engineers at Leslie E. Robertson and Associates, among them managing partner Sortine C, begin a typical workday in their offices a few blocks from the world's fourth tallest building, the 110-story towers of the World Trade Center. I was in my office, um, beautiful day, and um, an engineer came running to me and said, you know, a plane went into the Trade Center. And I thought it was one of those, you know, news helicopters that fly around here. So anyway, we were here and we all gathered around the windows in this conference room, uh, looking at the building. Um, and that's when we saw the, the second plane come by this way and um, just went straight into the building. That's when we realized it was not an accident. One horrifying day transformed the world's tallest skyscrapers from icons of power into potential death traps. When work resumed on the Shanghai World Financial Center a year and a half later, the design teams had more on their minds than typhoons and earthquakes. The horror of September 11 still hung over the world. One man who felt that horror keenly was structural engineer Leslie Robertson, who had also designed the World Trade Center. I got back to New York and went to the site and 
I guess I wasn't prepared for that. It took a while before I could even actually look at it. To this moment, I, I, I still think of all those people that I met, and they were looking for something that I, that I just don't have. They wanted, I think, largely they wanted me to say that their husband or their brother or their father died like that. And I don't know. I don't think I ever got through the experience of 9-11. I, I mean, it's a problem with me today. Robertson redesigned the financial center using some of the same innovative ideas he used to build the World Trade Center, especially the outrigger trusses and modular design that helped stabilize his lighter, taller building design while giving it extra strength. But the new design also made the World Financial Center a skyscraper for a post-9-11 world. We feel very confident that the project would sustain the impact of the aircraft that are flying right now. What if the unthinkable happened? and a fuel-laden jetliner smashed at top speed into the Shanghai World Financial Center. The impact area would be devastated, and the burning jet fuel would ignite an inferno. But the people inside the building would have options those inside the World Trade Center didn't have. I think in 9-11, the most frightening image for people is that the occupants above the fire had really had no choice. Uh, you know, they would either perish in the fire or they would choose to, to, to leap off. So I think that really affected us in a profound way. In the financial center, people above the impact zone can escape via secure stairway systems in the central core of the building. But just in case, the architects gave them another way out. We took the observation elevators, which are running up the corners of the building, and actually allow those to enter the office building at every 12 floors. So in a way, it becomes a sort of a last resort lifeboat. So in case the, the core itself is disabled, a lot of people's instinct is just to try to go down. But what you potentially could do is go up and then go to the, the corners of the building. Uh, and the elevators are, are really protected by the corner mega columns and then go down. If they still can't get out, they have yet another way to survive. This is floor 78, one of the specially designed refuge floors built every 12 levels. Deputy Manager Bernie Wren inspects its construction. Keenly aware of the role this room might play in any emergency. These rooms are designed to let people take refuge in if there is ever a fire or an accident. The whole building is enclosed by glazing except for the refuge floors. On these floors, there will be normal windows instead of glazing so that people can get fresh air while they wait to be rescued. And that's not all. These refuge floors are wrapped in specially thickened, fireproofed steel. People escaping a fire or a terrorist attack can make their way to one of these floors, knowing they have a greater chance of survival. And the World Financial Center's modular design could also save lives. If any part of the building collapses, the steel and trusses linking the modules should carry the load and keep the building upright. So I, I, I think uh, maybe it could be said that the Shanghai World Financial Center is perhaps the safest tall building on the planet. When it's finished, the Shanghai World Financial Center will be the tallest building in mainland China, but not in the world. Even at 492 meters, 
Its top floor will be 16 meters shorter than Taipei 101 spire. But that doesn't bother Bernie Ren. The other building is higher only because of the antenna on top. But this building will allow people to walk at a height of 492 meters, which is much higher than the people can walk in the other building. For me, 492 meters is a record. Even before it's finished, the Shanghai World Financial Center is already a soaring tribute to Shanghai and a signal to the world that China is the rising power of the third millennium. But for the teams of dedicated, courageous people who have worked so hard and risked so much, this megastructure will always be more than record-breaking kilometers of concrete, glass, and steel. The Shanghai World Financial Center will be an icon. We hope that it will represent Shanghai. I'm happy. It was a relatively dangerous project to do, but it was quite well paid. I heard the Shanghai municipal government is going to build a 120-story building. I hope next time I can do my part on that one. You look at it and you say, wow, right? It hits you right away. So. Uh, much more so than, than your usual high-rise building. I think it's an exceptional building. Soaring tall in spite of financial disaster. Built to survive the relentless fury of nature and of man. An icon of beauty, power, genius. The Shanghai World Financial Center renews our faith in humanity's drive to overcome challenges, recover from tragedy, and keep on reaching for the sky. Brand new Megastructures returns to China at the same time next week. And after the break, we take a gamble on the world's biggest casino.